Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dan Lee. I am the developer support engineer behind the Google Gadgets API. And in this video, I'm just going to talk really briefly about uh, just giving you guys a general overview about the Google Gadgets API and how to create and develop your own gadgets out there, how to embed it on Google. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the different development tools that are available to you guys. And so uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing you guys need to understand is basically what gadgets are. Um, uh, we can talk about what they are from a technical perspective um, and then uh, from a user's point of view what they are as well. So from a technical point of view, um, gadgets are nothing more than just simple uh, externally hosted XML files that you have. You can host them anywhere on, on any public server. Uh, if you have your own site and domain, um, you can just upload an XML up there. Uh, we have our own little XML spec, which I'll talk about in a minute. So once your gadget XML is actually externally hosted on one of your remote servers, you can add this gadget to just about uh, any property on any third-party web page, on iGoogle, on Google Desktop, etc. So uh, really quickly, uh, if you look at uh, the XML spec that we have here, um, this is an example of the most simplest type of gadget that you'll see. I mean, everyone knows um, we start with a Hello World example. So um, here it is. Uh, this basically, you see a parent, a root element module. Um, underneath there, there's a module press tag, and then underneath there, there's a content tag as well. So um, I'll go into a little bit more uh, details a little bit later on about what each uh, section means in the XML. But basically, uh, in about what is that six, seven lines of XML that you have a gadget running right there. It's not an incredibly useful gadget yet, but um, it's it's a start. So um, gadgets, uh, from a user's point of view, we like to call them. Uh, we like to think of them as mini web pages or mini websites. Um, these portable uh, HTML that can be rendered in just about any different property. Um, it's capable of rendering all the same web technologies that you guys are familiar with, which is HTML and JavaScript, CSS. It can render Flash, um, and it uses a lot of AJAX-type techn technologies with asynchronous calls to fetch remote data and things like that. So basically, I get a lot of questions from developers you know, about what can I do and what can I not do inside of a gadget. And, and most of the time, they know the answer. They just don't know it yet. But um, it's basically any time you, anytime you think of, uh, of limitations, it's basically you got to think of, you know, can I do it on a web page? Can I do it on, on, a, on a website? And if you, if you can, then the general answer is pretty much yes. So you can pretty much do anything that you can on a web page in the gadget. Um, in terms of uh, hosting the XML, I talked about how you can host this XML on your own domain if you have that service. But we also, Google offers a bunch of free hosting services to you as well. Um, to name a few, Google Code Hosting is probably one of the best because it offers subversion version control. Um, there's also other options like Google Pages um, and uh, Google Gadget Editor is also another really great choice. So, so here's a little bit, uh, a snapshot of a of more in depth, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the different parts in the gadget XML spec. So once again, um, in the top, uh, in the first child element under the module root, root tag, there you can see a module press uh, XML element right there. And uh, the the main important that we you know you want to understand about this is this is where you specify all your gadget metadata. So when you submit your gadget eventually to the iGoogle directory, for example. Um, this is where you're going to specify all the information like title and description. You're going to specify a screenshot and thumbnail. Uh, also, the width and height of your gadget. And a lot of this stuff is actually very important for you to include um, when you submit your gadget. Um, it helps users search um, and find your gadget in the directory, so it makes it more discoverable. So more people can find it, the more people are going to add it. And it's going to rise up in the directory the more people use it. So um, going on to the next session, um, there's these things called user prefs, which we uh, see them as, define them as user configurable preferences. So if, when, I, when, I, when a user adds a gadget to their home page, um, it basically provides you as a developer, uh, gives, you as a developer want to give the users the option to configure your gadget in different ways. For example, if you have a clock gadget, you know, which is very popular, you know, many, you'll want to make, maybe give the users the option to change the color or change the time zone and things like that. And, and this is where you will be able to do that by specifying various user press. In the content tags, um, this, is, this is the bulk of your gadget. This is like where all of your HTML is going to go and all the logic. Um, like I said, it's, it's just the majority of it is going to be HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Some people use that as well. Um, and as you can see here, this is just an, uh, an extension of the Hello World example that we showed previously. Um, and you can just see the XML, the, the HTML uh, markup 
just right there. So um, going a little, a little bit more depth uh, about user prefs, um, there's different types of user prefs that um, are going to render different types of forms or different types of HTML forms to the user when the when it's rendered on iGoogle. So for example, um, we have a bunch of different types. We have a type bool, type enum, um, string, for example. And each of them, are, as you can see in the slide, are going to uh, you know, basically get rendered as a different type of HTML form, such as a checkbox or a drop-down menu. And, and with that, you know, as you can see on the right, it's, an, it's, it's a screenshot of this tree frog gadget, which is actually a real gadget that one of our external developers had created. And you know, he basically provided a whole bunch of uh, options that users can configure. And they can change the color of the background, change the color of the tree frog, et cetera. So, uh, and, and the general, uh, it seems like you know, users love options. And the more options that you give them, um, the better it is uh, for them, the better experience it is for them. So uh, the last bullet there talks about hidden user prefs. And this is actually really important for gadgets that are, are, are rendered on Google because um, there's a way that you can actually store data into the gadget so to make your data sort of persistent. So when somebody uh, goes to iGoogle and renders your gadget and then goes somewhere else or comes back or reloads the page, uh, you, can ha you can save some data back to our servers. Um, and uh, when the gadget re-renders itself, it's going to be able to read that data back in and pick up from where it left off. So this is particularly useful for uh, the simplest example would be like a to-do gadget, a to-do list, where you can you know, type in the things that you have to do today or next week, and, and every time you go back to it, Google, it's going to remember that data. So let's say you want to get started and start writing a gadget yourself. Um, what are the first steps that you guys want to do um, in terms of getting started? Uh, and this is what this slide um, highlights here. So the first thing you want to really do is um, kind of decide, I guess. You kind of have a decision. Well. Do I want to develop you know, my gadget on Google? Or um, there's this other tool that we have uh, called the Google Gadgets Editor, which um, also is another kind of development path that you can take. Um, it's a little bit more simpler in a way, um, but most, the majority of traffic that gadgets still uh, get are still coming from my Google users. So it's, you know, it's definitely to your advantage to, to test your gadget and, and, and develop it on iGoogle as well. Um, but no one's stopping you from using both tools at the same time. So if you're going to like, kind of go down that Google path, you want to first add the developer gadget. And the main uh, important thing there is that all gadgets, all gadget XMLs are cached by our servers. So if a gadget gets you know, a million page views per week, let's say, um, it's only you know, your, your server, whoever's hosting the XML, is only going to really see a couple hundred requests uh, literally per day. So that's the benefit of caching. But when you're actually writing your gadget and you're making changes, and you go back to a Google to refresh to see your changes. Um, you want to disable caching in order to do that, in order to see your changes. So um, the developer gadget allows you to do that, which is the main reason you have that there. Um, so after you add the developer gadget, you want to obviously create the XML spec, and you want to upload that to some public server that's accessible by Google. Uh, the developer gadget has a, a form that you can uh, enter in the URL of your gadget and, and add it quickly to your Google page. And once that's on, you want to go ahead and disable caching, um, and then you're all set. So you can like go ahead and start building a gadget, make changes, upload the changes back to your server, and then um, just kind of go from there. Um, and, and I guess it's just more of like a trial and error kind of thing. <clears throat> if you want to go down the uh, Google Gadget Editor path, uh, there's a URL there on the slide. Um, it's also um, probably in the first section of our developer guide. And there is. <laughs> There's, a, there's an edit and preview um, tabs for the Google Gadget Editor. Um, and maybe I can show the demo of this right now. So here is the Google Gadget Editor. Um, you can get to it, like I said, um, it's in our public documentation. So if you go to our developer's guide, and there's a link that says Google Gadgets Editor, it'll automatically jump you down to the spot um, down here. And, um, you know, it it's actually looks really simple, but um, it actually is a pretty powerful tool. Um, it has a lot of different features on it. Um, and as you can see, there's a, the first thing you see is that we have a text editor that has some sy syntax highlighting. And it automatically loads up the Hello World gadget, which is um, you know, kind of where everyone kind of starts off with. And if you click on the Preview tab, you know, you, and keep in mind that this gadget is not hosted anywhere yet. You know, it's, it's rendering it directly from the editor. It'll actually render the gadget right there on the spot for you. So um, it kind of eliminates all the pain in, in having to you know, make changes to your gadget and re-upload it to, to your server every time. So it actually makes development a lot, lot easier, especially if you're making 
some quick modifications and quick tweaks to your gadget. Um, one of the other features in this gadget, um, in, in the GGE, which is short what we call it, is that you can actually save and, and host um, any of your gadgets directly through this as well. It's tied into your Google account, so the only requirement is that you log in to Google. Um, once, that's, once that's done, you can actually just go into the file menu and click Save, um, give it a file name, and then it'll, it'll save your gadget for you. So this is actually another an option for you to where you can host your gadget. Yeah, so um, like I was saying before, uh, you can d there's not one one right choice for you. Basically, um, I think it's beneficial to use both tools. Um, the GGE comes in handy in a lot of different situations, um, but you definitely want to go ahead and test your gadget on Google and make sure uh, that it renders properly. That you know that your HTML is formatted and it and it works to fit well within small dimensions as well as the larger ones. Um, so those are all things that you want to consider when writing a gadget. Um, here's just like a slide that just does a quick comparison between the two. Um, if you're developing primarily on iGoogle, I mean, you, you, there's some benefits and there's some features that are going to be available to you there, which is not available in the Google Gadget Editor. So on iGoogle, it actually requires that your XML is externally hosted somewhere. Um, and it does support all the API features, so it supports you know, storing data back into your user press, um, and it, it also supports other features like dynamic height. Um, stuff, GGA doesn't support that. So um, with uh, Google, though, when you develop your gadget, you're going to have to reload the page every time you make a change, which can be kind of a pain, um, depending on how many gadgets you have on there. And it's also pretty hard to test uh, your gadget in different sizes. GGE kind of gives you a little bit more control over that stuff. But it doesn't have, it doesn't support um, as many API feature libraries like as iGoogle does. So dynamic height and set press, uh, storing data is not going to work. So that's pretty much a general, really quick overview um, of the gadgets um, API. Um, hopefully, those will, you know, give you some ideas on how to get started, and give you a really quick uh, impression about, you know, what gadgets are capable of. Um, if you if you need or want to like. Uh, find out a lot more information about it. We have tons of, uh, we have a really good set of docs, um, so just go to our documentation uh, on off of code.google.com and there's a bunch of different features that you can, you can check out. So, there you go. <laughs>